Alex Berenson on Saturday broke the news that a Parkinson's expert had visited the White House eight times basically in the last eight months. New York Times says those visits happened between 7 and 9 a.m. The White House came out and said there are thousands of people who work at the White House. That doesn't necessarily mean that it was Joe Biden that was involved. For anyone out there that wants to buy that argument, let me just point this out. If you have an early morning doctor coming to your place of employment multiple times, the only way that would make sense is if you also work at that place of employment. So I think it's very hard for the White House to argue that this is not Joe Biden. And let me talk about this revelation in particular. Again, credit to Alex Berenson who broke it on Saturday morning. But now with the, uh, the, the New York Times cover following through and writing about it during our show when the news broke from them on Monday. This is potentially, and I say potentially, even though I think all the evidence adds up to this is what happened, but I'm saying potentially. This is potentially the biggest lie about presidential health since Franklin Delano Roosevelt going all the way back to before most of us were alive, you would have to go back essentially 80 years nearly for a lie about the president's health to have been this common, uh, to have been this significant, to have been this embraced. The reason why I go back to FDR is everybody to a large extent knew about FDR being in a wheelchair and the polio and everything else, but they helped to protect the president from that becoming news. That is, the press did not write about Roosevelt in a wheelchair. They allowed the idea that he was able to walk, that he was able to stand, all of that to be manufactured and hidden from the American public. Uh, Roosevelt elected, for those of you that are history nerds, 1932, 1936, 1940, and 1944. Roosevelt was elected four different times before we said a president can only serve for two terms. You know who knows that, by the way? A little bit of a shout out. My son, who got a five on his AP history test results today, even though he didn't take AP history. Love it. That is a proud history nerd moment to have a son who doesn't even take AP history and is still able to go get a five on the AP history exam. He just took regular history, said, I'm ready to take the exam, shows up, gets a five on it, credit to him. Also like his dad, who also got a five on the AP history exam back in the day. Reason why I bring this up, I believe that we are seeing a potentially criminal cover-up of Joe Biden's health. And the idea that you could be having all of these different issues emerging as are clearly occurring and that no one could know about the health-related conditions of Joe Biden, I think is a total lie. Now, and potentially not only a total lie, but actually a criminal one. And I think there is a strong argument that all these people out there who have argued, oh, you're going to be on the wrong side of history if you support Donald Trump. Oh, you're going to be on the wrong side of history if you don't support school shutting down, if you don't support masking, if you don't support six feet of social distancing. They've all been wrong on everything. All of these so-called experts, all of the smart people in media, they have failed on an epic level when it pertains to the signal, single most important job that they have, which is whether the president has the mental and physical capacity to actually do the job of president of the United States. Because you and I can argue on a variety of different things. What should the corporate tax rate be? What's the uh, requisite amount that we should borrow? What should interest rates be? Uh, what do we think should happen with student loans? How involved should the government be when it comes to securing the southern border? What should we do with Ukraine? How should we handle uh, the war in the Middle East? All of those things are very debatable issues. But what they all rely on at the most basic level is having a commander-in-chief 
who is able to analyze all of these different arguments and render judgment on many of the most difficult and consequential issues in the world today. I do not believe, and this is no new story for me, but I do not believe that the evidence out there supports that Joe Biden has the mental and physical capacity to be president. And about 75% of you roughly agree with me. This is not some outlandish opinion of mine. This is something that three out of every four of you, Democrat, Republican, Independent, agree with me on. Yet, as recently as a few days before the June 27th debate, NBC News wrote a story saying that I was spreading disinformation by sharing videos, which were public videos of the G7, of Juneteenth, of Joe Biden not being able to look like he's pot, uh, look like he's able to do the job. I would say to NBC News now, would you like to retract your criticism of me when I said that I believe Joe Biden doesn't have the mental or physical capability to be president of the United States? I believe that I am correct. I think the debate on June 27th and the subsequent events since and before have provided ample evidence, whether it's D-Day performance, whether it's the G7, whether it's the debate, whether it's Juneteenth, you pick an event and I believe there is a talking point or a video of body movement that demonstrates Joe Biden can't do the job. And right now what we're dealing with is what happens when you have an elderly relative who won't give up the keys to his car, who won't agree to move into an assisted living facility, even though there is now ample evidence that he or she is not able to actually live alone and manage themselves as an adult should or would. Most families in America, sadly, have had to be through this, gone, gone through this, where you have an elderly relative where they don't have great cognition, they don't want to give up their independence, they don't want to leave their home, they don't want to leave uh, the ability to drive a car. These are big issues. Unfortunately, our nation is dealing with them right now. And so Biden, based on that letter and the interview that he did with Morning Joe, is saying, I'm not leaving. Large majorities of uh, the nation, as I just said, think Biden shouldn't be the nominee. 75% think he doesn't have the physical and mental capacity to be president now, much less in the future. Around half of all Democrats don't think that Joe Biden should be the nominee. But what mechanism is there? to force him to leave if he won't leave. I'm not sure there's an easy answer to that. And from a purely winning the election perspective, I do not believe that Joe Biden can beat Donald Trump. Now, I still want all of you to go out there and vote, even people who disagree with me and might vote on the other side. I want as many people as possible to go out and make sure their voices are heard. But if you look at the map, right now there are considered to be seven toss-up states North Carolina, Georgia, Nevada, Arizona, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. Trump leads in all seven of those states. Additionally, there are polls out, including from inside of the Biden campaign itself, that show Trump either leading, tied, or basically even with Biden in Maine, in New Hampshire, uh, in Virginia, in Minnesota, New Mexico, States that should not be remotely close. Indeed, I just ticked off five states that are not even really officially considered battlegrounds where Trump is either tied or has the lead. And I just ran through seven different states that are considered battlegrounds, all of which Trump has the lead in. That's 12 total states. Of those 12 states, Trump only won one of them in 2020. This entire race is being, that was North Carolina, this entire race is being fought on Joe Biden's turf. And he is losing ground every single day. And I think the challenge that the Biden team has is nobody's changing their mind about whether Joe Biden can be president or not in his favor. 
everybody is actually moving in the direction of he can't do the job. And so Trump is in a unique spot. He's leading. He doesn't even have to get that much attention. He just has to watch as Joe Biden hemorrhages support and burns everything down around him. How aggressive is the Democrat Party going to be when it comes to trying to get the keys, the nomination, the metaphorical keys away from Joe Biden, who can no longer drive the car? Biden's defense is, hey, this is what happens when you rig a primary. Nobody really challenged him. RFK Jr. had to leave because he felt the DNC was rigging the process. Dean Phillips, a Minnesota Democrat congressman, challenged him, said exactly what I'm telling you right now, which is Joe Biden doesn't have the mental or physical capacity to be president, and Democrat voters overwhelmingly did not pay attention to him. So when Biden comes out and says, I'm the nominee, I won 87% of the votes, I have way more delegates than I need to be the nominee, I'm not giving this up, I'm not sure what the mechanism is to get Democrats to force him out. Donors can say, I'm not going to give money. Individual Congress people or senators or governors can come out and say, you're going to lose and you're going to drag us down on the ticket when it comes to the Senate, when it comes to Congress, when it comes to governor's races. All of those things can be true, but I'm not sure there's actually a mechanism by which Biden can be forced out of the nomination without him choosing to go. That's where we are right now as we sit here on July 8th. Happy birthday to my lovely wife, Laura, who is uh, celebrating the 19th birthday, I believe it is, of our marriage. Next month, we're going to have been married 20 years. So uh, happy birthday to my wife, Laura. So we sit here on July 8th. I don't know how we are going to change the direction that everything is going. It's a mess. It's a real mess. I haven't heard a lot of people talk about this. So let me take you back in time. 1997. I am a freshman at George Washington University. I have a subscription to the Washington Post. I come back after my first semester January 1998, I walk downstairs to the dorm, first floor, pick up my newspaper, which was delivered right there at the front lobby. On the front page is the story about Bill Clinton having an alleged affair with an intern, Monica Lewinsky. From that point forward, impeachment, all of the chaos that follows there, I went and watched the impeachment hearings. You could go as a member of the public. I was a student, very interested in history. I went and watched the debates in the uh, House Judiciary Committee, all of that process. I was fascinated by it. Wasn't actually that important relative to the overall safety and security of Bill Clinton or me or any of you that were alive then as it pertains to the United States. That is, if you think about it now in the historical context under which it occurred, the idea that Bill Clinton had an affair with an intern didn't really impact his ability to be president of the United States and do a good job while he was president. Now, Some of you out there can rightly say, well, he's the president of the United States. He's held to a higher standard when it comes to his behavior. You might say, hey, a 40-something-year-old guy with a 20-something-year-old girl who was his intern is inappropriate. That should never happen. Oh, by the way, this is pre-Me Too. All those things are arguments that you can make. What I'm focused on is... There was an argument that Bill Clinton shouldn't be able to remain president of the United States because he had an affair with an intern, lied about it, all of that ensuing chaos. In retrospect, the American public didn't care. And Clinton went on to finish his term, and I think Bill Clinton was a pretty good two-term president. In fact, I would argue that in my life, the two best two-term presidents were Ronald Reagan 
and Bill Clinton. Some of you will agree. Some of you will disagree. Maybe some of you like George W. Bush. Maybe some of you like Obama. I would say the two best two-term presidents were Reagan and Clinton in my life. 80s pretty awesome. 90s pretty awesome. I think it had something to do with the presidents that we had in office at the time. And in, and by the way, when they finished their terms, they would have won additional terms if they had been able to run. Even though Reagan was old and even though Clinton had his scandals, Clinton, I believe, would have beaten George W. Bush. I think Reagan, certainly, when his vice president was elected, that's, in effect, a stamp of approval of them. The reason why I bring this up, Richard Nixon, forced to leave the White House over Watergate, which was a stupid, not very successful, almost no benefit gained robbery of the Watergate apartment complex, business complex, right down the street from where I lived in Washington, D.C. too. Clinton with Monica Lewinsky, Nixon with Watergate. The two biggest scandals that probably you would point to of a president in anyone who is watching or listening right now's life. Joe Biden's health is a far bigger story and a far potentially more significant criminal enterprise than anything involving Watergate or anything involving Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky. I'm surprised that I don't hear anybody talking about this. And you say, okay, what do you mean by that, Clay? Joe Biden and the cover-up of his health goes directly to whether he can do the job of president of the United States or not. When you are lying about Biden's health, you're not lying about a break-in and Watergate. You're not lying about who or who did not give a blowjob to the president of the United States. Neither one of those things directly impacts Nixon or Clinton's ability to be president of the United States. In fact, I wish we could wave a magic wand right now and put either Nixon or Clinton in the White House right now because I think they would do an infinitely better job than Biden. What we are talking about right now is potentially the largest criminal cover-up of a crime to ever occur in any of our lives relating to the president of the United States. And I didn't even get into the Trump stuff, but the Trump stuff is nothing compared to what is going on with Biden. How in the world is this not a bigger story than even it is, and it's a big story? What's going on with Biden's health? Why was there a Parkinson's expert who visited eight straight months the White House in the morning hours and I believe was involved in helping to treat Joe Biden? Why is the entire apparatus that tried to pretend Joe Biden was healthy until that entire argument collapsed surrounding the debate on June 27th? Why isn't everybody asking the question that Fred Thompson asked during the Watergate hearings, who knew and when did they know it? Who knew when Joe Biden was diagnosed with severe health-related issues and when did they know it? And by the way, the word diagnose can't turn into the Bill Clinton, that depends on what the definition of is, is. Because I suspect that lawyers are now involved with Joe Biden's medical conditions, and they're trying to avoid an official diagnosis because then it requires a knowledge associated with his uh, medical condition. I suspect that right now they are trying to treat his symptoms while avoiding acknowledging what is causing those symptoms and officially diagnosing him for what is going on there. I suspect that's what's at play right now. Corinne Jean-Pierre, so this is a big story, okay? This is bigger than Clinton and the blowjobs with Monica Lewinsky. This is bigger than Richard Nixon and Watergate. This is bigger than anything alleged or uh, relating or proven that happened with Trump. This is the biggest 
potential criminal cover-up of a presidential-related issue that goes directly to whether the president can do the job or not that has ever occurred in anyone's life probably watching or listening to this unless you were alive when FDR was president of the United States and died back in Georgia. Was at Warm Springs, Georgia, in all the way back in, was it 1945, if I remember correctly? Unless you were alive then, and most of you were not, then this is the biggest presidential criminal scandal that I believe we have potentially ever seen in any of our lives.